All right, I gotta say, I love the Star Wars type scroll, right? That was pretty cool. So, Nate, well done. Thank you for putting that together, brother. Uh, as we begin, uh, we're gonna read a little bit in Hosea this morning, but uh, let's start first by calling on God's name once more. Jesus, you are the word. You are the word uh, of God that came to Hosea, that caused him to speak and to do many things in your name. Lord, you are the one who sends the Holy Spirit to us today. Lord, open our hearts and minds to receive your spirit all over again, that you may write those truths uh, of your love and your faithfulness to us, uh, that we will always be reminded of who you are and what you do for us. Help us to know that we are treasured by you. We pray this in your name. Amen. So Hosea is not a typical prophet. Um, well, they all kind of do weird things. And I guess in that sense, Hosea is no exception. And Hosea has a few different things to say in particular about God. My guess is you can pick up from words that you've said and some of the songs we've sing. There's going to be something about faithfulness this morning. And that's true. Um, but there's a little bit more to the story than that. Um, and so let's start with the promise that God makes to his people through Hosea in chapter 2, starting at verse 16. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me Ishi, my husband. No longer will you call me my Baal, my master. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, or the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow and the sword and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. This is the word of the Lord for us. So the Lord has been busy. The Lord has been busy, uh, I mean, truthfully, God is always at work. Yes, that's true. In your homes and in mine, in this world around us, even in ways that we don't uh, always understand or some ways we don't even see. But in particular, God has been working in the last 24 hours here uh, through a, a wedding and a baptism and worship. And then godparents are renewing their, their vows or their, their commitments to, the, to a baptized child yesterday. And then today we had worship and worship and worship and another baptism. And God is doing things and, and reigning in this place. And it's beautiful to see and be a part of. But at that first thing I mentioned, a wedding, it caused me to remember some things that God is up to in Hosea. And I want you, if you are married or you're thinking about it, um, think about, if you're thinking about marriage, think about what you picture your courtship period, that dating time before you get married, uh, maybe before you're engaged or after you're engaged. Uh, picture what you hope that's like. Married folks, remember. Remember what your courtship period was like. For uh, my wife, Lisa, and I, our courtship was long distance. She was going to school in Chicago. I was going to school in Nebraska. Um, and so we relied on the reasonability of plane tickets at that time. And uh, a lot more on AOL Instant Messenger. AIM, anybody? No? Yeah, all right. All right, all right. I see you. I see you out there. Um, and uh, that was before texting really became a thing, although I think we, we texted a little bit too. Um, no? All right. That was after we were married, I guess. I don't know. Uh, maybe I didn't remember more of our courtship period, I guess. <laughs> but the point is, as you enter into courtship, you really focus in on what you love about the other person, what they love about you, your hopes and dreams, the things you're passionate about, the things you want to accomplish, the things the other person want to accomplish. And you think about, is there a way that God is is calling us to do this together as husband and wife. Typical courtship. Maybe some differences, but in many ways typical. Hosea's courtship 
is very confusing. Because you think about the person, your hopes and dreams, you're blending your families together, you know, you're doing something intentional, really thinking about it. You're also a little picky on the person you, you do that with, rightly so. You want to guard your heart. God commands Hosea to find a woman of ill repute, to find a woman who is already living outside the relationship of marriage, already going after multiple different men. That's the one God commands him to marry. And so Hosea finds Gomer. Now, how many of you, when you hear the word Gomer, think about a show called The Andy Griffith Show? Okay. Not the same Gomer, all right? Very, very different Gomer, all right? This Gomer is a woman, <laughs> and this Gomer is just unfaithful. And that's the one that Hosea chooses to marry. So they get married, she gives him children, and then she sells herself as an indentured servant again. Gomer confuses her worth with usefulness. And she confuses usefulness with being finding her identity and, and who God is calling her to be as a woman, as a wife, as a mom. And she loses track of all that and gets distracted. She gets distracted and, and sells herself, becomes an indentured servant. And so Gomer confuses the word husband for something else. Uh, so the word that sometimes is used for husband in Hebrew is the word Baal which we typically in English pronounce Baal, and we recognize that. If you know anything about the story of Israel, you know that, that Baal or Baals are idols, right? They're false gods that Israel chases after. But that word Baal or Baal is, can be translated as another word for husband, but a word that means like master, like a husband that owns something or someone. Not the type of husband we typically think of when we think of husband and wife. And so when God's saying, no longer will you call me Baal, that's what he means. No longer, he's saying to his people, no longer will you look at me and think of me in a transactional kind of way. I'm not a this for that kind of God. I'm faithful to you and to you alone. That's the kind of God that is speaking through Hosea to Gomer, to his people, and to you. But Gomer still gets confused. I, I think there are several of us that are getting confused. Maybe you can identify with the pressures of, of marriage and family life and you uh, can identify with somebody who, who wants to reject all that and do something else instead, rejecting her place. Or maybe that's a little tricky. Maybe it's not quite what you identify with, but how many people pleasers do we have here today? And make me happy by raising your hand, please. <laughs> right, yes, my people, you are, I am, I am with you. Um, I want to make everybody happy, and I want everyone to like me. And when that doesn't happen, um, I freak out internally, and sometimes I get mean outside, and I try to fix it, right? I want to fix it, all right, if something's wrong, if somebody doesn't like me, then there's something I gotta be able to do to fix that. Or if uh, things are going wrong, and it's just kind of out there, I will take, I will try to take the blame. Like, all of this must be my fault, and so if people can just have something or someone to blame, and if that person could be me, then we can all just keep on going and be happy. That's messed up, right? That is not healthy or good at all. Having a relationship with someone who is not your husband or wife as though they were is also not good, and that's messed up. 
no, no matter how it's justified in how many different stories, the story God tells us is something different. And he uses Israel's unfaithfulness and Gomer's unfaithfulness as an opportunity to talk about choice. And he commands Hosea to go after Gomer, to redeem her from her choice to leave and enslave herself, to bring her back. And that's what Hosea does over and over and over again. He is a faithful husband, the kind of husband. Now, Hosea himself as a man is not perfect. He is a person. He is fully human. But God is fully faithful to Israel. And we see that especially in Jesus. God, who is fully human and fully God, Jesus, he is faithful in ways that none of us can be. And so just like Hosea continues to choose Gomer, God continues to choose sinners who get distracted, who even in the midst of singing songs about God's faithfulness, sometimes I'm thinking about anything else. Sometimes our minds wander. Sometimes our hearts wander. We wander away. And we wonder what life would be like if things were different. And sometimes that idea of difference is so refreshing for us. We chase after that instead of the place where we are at doing the thing we promise to do, being the people God has called us to be. And when we do that, even when we entertain that, we're tempted by that. God is present with you. God is faithful to you. When you sin, now I used to think about this when I was a kid. When you sin, when I sin, I thought God just kind of stepped out of the room, right? And then he came back in when I was done, right? When I'm living off to my parents or or fighting with my brother or doing something far worse, I just thought God wasn't there and then he was, right? That's not how God is by the grace of Jesus. He is present with you, (laughs) even in the midst of sin. How can God do that? How does that happen? Because Jesus came, and all your doubts, all your struggles, all your pain, all your shame, Jesus calls that. All the the reasons you want to get away from this life God has called you to, this life you're living, Jesus took all of that on himself, calls it his own. The punishment that should have been yours, Jesus takes for you. Instead, he gives you life. He gives you a fresh start. He gives you redemption. He comes and he redeems you over and over and over again. And it can be something small, like yesterday, in between wedding and baptism and worship, I get a call from my bride, my beloved, that our transmission is no more, right? And like big picture, it's a small thing, but for a family that's going three different directions in one night, it's a bit of a problem. Maybe you're having problems on par with a transmission. Maybe something a little bit more than that. Like you're waiting for a transplant. You're waiting for healing in your body. You're waiting for healing in your heart or your mind. There's a fracture in you that's deep. God is with you. He knows that pain, yours in particular. He's with you to bring you faith to believe. And as he brings it in his time, healing. Why does God do that? Because God God treasures you. For the sake of Jesus and what he's done, he's taken everything away that would ever separate you from him forever. And he chooses you. He treasures you. God comes after you over and over and over again. God calls you by name. And God brings you worth even when you've you've spent it on everything else other than him. He goes after you and restores your worth in him by his blood, by his resurrection, 
by his truth and his spirit coming to you right now in this place. God treasures you. There's a story uh, a, a beloved, a treasured professor of mine tells when he was a pastor in a, in a congregation he was serving. He went to go visit a woman in a hospital, a member of, of his church. And he goes into the room and there's a stack of books there and he sits down and begins talking with her and he looks over the books and notice one of the titles is like Gentle Rogue, you know? Some, some trashy romance novels. Looks back at her and just kind of stays focused. And she picks up on his momentary distraction. She's like, Pastor, a friend of mine thought I could use something to read. And she brings me these. Please get rid of them. And so he does. He finishes up praying with her, talking with her, grabs her books and heads out. And so you can see this pastor wearing a collar, carrying a stack of trashy romance novels. And a nurse walks by. And says, finally, a church I can be a part of. <laughs> and this leads to the conversation. They, they talk a little bit. She shares a little bit about her story. And he talks to her about coming to church. And she says, oh, pastor, I could never come to your church. If I came in there, the walls might fall down. He looks at her and says, that's okay. Because Jesus can build a new church. And this time, it will include you. God treasures you exactly where you are. Despite your sin, he doesn't pretend like all oh, that's okay. He gets rid of it. He brings you back. He redeems you. He treasures you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we've heard a good word from God today. We've got this message from Hosea of our confusion and God's choice and how he treasures us. But God holds on to us. As the band comes up, let's take a minute, we'll pray, and we'll respond in faith to God's faithfulness. Jesus, thank you for your word that meets us here and now. Thank you for what you do to make us yours over and over and over again. Help us to call you the one that loves us. And yes, you are the one that does own us. You redeemed us. We were bought at a price, but Lord, you give us faith freely. So help us to believe that faith, to respond in faith, to respond to your faithfulness. Amen.